Hey, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to episode six of StageMaker Fridays. And it is the last episode of the season already. Time flies. My name is Julian. I'm a principal developer advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. And please meet my brilliant co-presenter. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Segelen and I'm a senior data scientist working with the AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. Thanks again for joining us, Sego. We're going to need your expertise. Uh, everybody, let me remind you that episodes are 100% live and uh, you can ask all your questions in the chat. Uh, we have uh, friendly and expert moderators waiting for your questions. Uh, I keep telling you there are no silly questions. Ask anything that you like about machine learning and AWS, and uh, we are trying to help you learn. Uh, so don't be shy, just go for it. Okay, so this is the last episode of the season, like I said, and we're going to try and close the season in style, right? No <laughs> cliffhangers. We get the big event. And this week, we're going to focus on computer vision, which is obviously a very popular topic for machine learning. And specifically, we're going to focus on large scale training. Sego, please tell us more. <laughs> yes, indeed, Julian. Uh, today, we are going to talk about how you can scale your training job on large and complex data sets, uh, which are pretty common uh, in the computer vision domain. Uh, indeed, uh, computer vision uh, requires a lot of training uh, to reach good accuracy. Scaling is really a fundamental question for both experimentation and production as you want to keep your training time and cost under control. Uh, today, so we are going to learn uh, several techniques uh, leveraging SageMaker capabilities in order to do so. Bringing your data science project to the next level uh, with a scalable uh, deep learning infrastructure is the main takeaway of this final episode. All right, we're going to go big. So yeah. <laughs> SageMaker has a lot of built-in features that make it really easy to scale. Uh, and the, the great thing is we're going to keep using the same familiar training and deployment workflow that we used all season, right? So when I say big, uh, what do I mean <laughs> exactly? Sego, give us some feedback on that. So this is really a think big uh, episode uh, because we're going to train today um, a ResNet 50 network from scratch on the ImageNet data set, uh, which is, of course, the reference data set for many computer vision applications. So today, be ready to train the SageMaker building image classification at Go on some 150 gigabytes of data with a large P3 GTU instance. Uh, we're going to use pipe mode, distributed training. So uh, this is really the cherry on the cake, uh, on the cake of the SageMaker Friday season two. Oh, yeah, definitely. So <laughs> looks like we're going to dive this time into machine learning engineering. Exactly, right? yeah. And, and you will see that it doesn't require any infrastructure skills. So if you think, oh, I'm a data scientist, you know, this is going to be about VPCs and subnets and uh, and SSH keys. And uh, no, 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 no. It's going to be about <laughs> you scaling very easily with very large data sets. So get some coffee, get your energy drink, get anything that you need because we're going to start now. So. As usual, the material is online, and uh, let me share my screen and uh, show you the repository that we're going to use today. Uh, so it's actually one of the examples from my SageMaker book, and, uh, and you can find it uh, in this uh, GitHub repo. Of course, you will find the URL on the final slide, okay? And so it's building an image classification model on ImageNet, right? So, of course, we're going to dive into the code and, uh, and some data preparation and lots of different things. But as always, we want to focus on the problem first, okay, and how we're going to solve it. So, the, the ML problem itself 
is pretty simple to understand, right? Uh, we want mm -hmm. to classify images. Um, this is kind of a hello world thing to do <laughs> when you learn about deep learning. It's obviously a common use case for many customers. There are plenty of good models for image classification. So we're not going to go deep into what image classification is because I'm I'm sure you you're you're doing this already. The real problem is how do you scale your training jobs when you have to deal with very large data sets? Mm -hmm. Sego, what what can we say about this? So yes, Julian, exactly. Uh, this question of uh, scalability is a very, very important topic for our customers. Um, as a data scientist at the ML Solution Lab, uh, I have two recurring questions from deep learning practitioners. Uh, the first one is, um, can you check if we are making good use, um, good use of the infrastructure, infrastructure we are paying for? And the second question uh, I have um, is, um, can we train faster without spending more money? Um, so, of course, uh, this response um, depends on the customer's uh, business requir requirements. So, some companies run uh, training jobs that last days, uh, even weeks, uh, whereas uh, some other customers need to get the freshest models possible, uh, retraining every hour. Uh, but in both cases, um, our customers want to avoid uh, potential bottlenecks uh, in their training infrastructure, which may lie in their uh, CPU, GPU, memory, disk utilization in, uh, in the training throughput. But um, in a nutshell, uh, deep learning practitioners want to get the most optimized workload in order to be able to scale. And uh, today, uh, we are going to see in action some of the techniques which can help here. Indeed, uh, we're going to take a very good example of uh, scaling a training job uh, by training from scratch uh, an image classification algorithm on the uh, ImageNet datasets. Plus, um, we will explain uh, why and how uh, transfer learning techniques can bring speed uh, to your uh, deep learning projects. OK, so I think it's an easy problem to understand. We have more data we, and, and training times get longer, or we have lots of training jobs mm -mm. and we want to run all of them and in, in, in scale, or we want to retrain as often as possible. Uh, some customers retrain every hour, sometimes less. And of course, like you said, training time costs want to be, uh, need to be under control. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we understand the problem. Uh, let's take a look at the data set. Um, so you'll see on my screen, uh, you, if you go to the ImageNet um, uh, website, uh, you can uh, you can see and you can uh, uh, understand how big this thing is. Uh, it has, uh, 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 millions of images uh, and it has you know thousands of categories um so let's for example so it's got mostly plants and and animals and objects right um so if you you can see all those uh, different categories and there is some really strange <laughs> stuff in there if you're curious right you, you'll find <laughs> lots of different things uh and uh and then you can uh, you know you can go and see the actual uh, hierarchy of uh, of classes and so on so you can actually explore it it's it's a huge data set um so sego why why is imagenet such an important data set uh can you tell us more about it yeah, and um, ImageLet is really a building block uh, of the modern computer uh, vision area. Uh, in reality, it has revolutionized the field of uh, large-scale uh, visual, visual recognition, and uh, ImageNet serves as a benchmark for many computer vision models. Uh, so this project was launched uh, more than 10 years ago by a very important professor, uh, Faith Bailey uh, from Stanford, uh, in order to provide a researcher uh, high quality labeled image datasets. So uh, the images uh, were, collecti were collected uh, from the web, 
and were labeled by a human labeler uh, using uh, Amazon Mecha Mechanical Turk uh, cross-sourcing cross tool. Uh, as a result, uh, ImageNet is a data set of over uh, 15 million labeled high resolution images uh, belonging to roughly 22,000 categories. And uh, these categories are organized uh, according to the World Net, World Net uh, hierarchy, in which uh, each node of the hierarchy is depict depicted by hundreds and thousands of images. So today, uh, we are going to use a lighter version of uh, this um, ImageNet. We are going to use a data set containing 1 million uh, images with uh, 1,000 classes. That's about um, 150 gigabytes of data. And um, so I mentioned the fact that uh, ImageNet revolutionized the field of computer vision because uh, starting in 2010, uh, as part of the uh, Pascal uh, Visual Object Challenge, uh, an annual competition called the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, which is called the I ILS VRC, uh, was held and lasts uh, until uh, 2017. Um, during this uh, ILS, ILS uh, VRC, um, several key milestones uh, in model architecture for image classification result uh, from these uh, eight years of competition, such as uh, AlexNet, uh, VGG, uh, GoogleNet, etc. So, so it's, actually, um, uh, if you can see on my screen now um, the um, the results from mm -hmm. uh, from that competition from 2010 to to 2016. Um, let me go full screen, and uh, and so each year you see the error margin that the the model was doing on image classification. So initially twenty eight percent point twenty eight point two percent of errors, down to twenty five, down to sixteen, down to uh, six point seven, three point six, and three zero. And the the competition stopped in in twenty seventeen. So the blue line is the error, right? And the red bars are how many layers we actually had in the winning model. So 2010, 2011, no deep learning, right? Shallow networks. And then starting 2012, I think AlexNet won 2012, right? Yeah, so exactly. that's AlexNet here with eight layers. And then as you see, quickly the number of layers grew very large and helped go down to very low errors. And it's it's usually considered that the the human error for image classification is about 5%. Mm -hmm. And so in 2015, we actually dropped below uh, human error. And, uh, and this winning network is called ResNet, and you're going to hear about it a little more. <laughs> so <laughs> this is how important uh, ImageNet is for, um, uh, for computer vision re research, right? Really, yeah. really important. So I mentioned ResNet, so I guess, you know, you know which algo we're going to use. And uh, Sego, tell us a little more about the ResNet. <laughs> Uh, yes. So today, um, as we already done, uh, as we did for uh, done uh, during the previous session, we are going to use a built-in algorithm uh, on SageMaker, and we are going to use the Amazon SageMaker image classification algorithm, which is a supervised learning uh, algo that supports uh, multi-label classification. Uh, in a nutshell, it's going to take an image as an input and outputs uh, one or more uh, labels assigned to, to that image. So this uh, built-in um, algorithm for SageMaker uses a um, convolutional neural network, the ResNet, that can be trained uh, from scratch or trained using uh, transfer learning when a large number of training images are not available. But let me explain quickly all of these concepts. So first, ResNet, uh, which means uh, residual networks. Uh, so this model, as we mentioned, was the winner of the IL ILS VRC 2015. It delivered an outstanding top five error rate under 3.6% using an extremely deep uh, CNN made of 152 layers. 
it is one of the most commonly used uh, neural net for uh, CV tasks. And uh, in a summary in the research paper, uh, the authors address the uh, degradation problem uh, observed while training deep, learn deep, learn deep neural nets by uh, using the skip connection and the so-called uh, deep residual layer mm -hmm. um, which is going to create, quite, uh, we're going to try to simplify, but um, the deep residual uh, layer um, plus the skip connection is going to create an identity connection between the layer. And um, by adding, add, adding uh, this skip connection, um, the signal can flow easily across the whole network, which mm -hmm. starts uh, making progress even if some layer have not started learning yet. Um, in other words, um, inputs can forward propagate faster through the residual connection, connection across layers. So this is like the really the two um, improvements or the two adding stuff uh, in the ResNet, the skip connection and the notion of deep residual layer. Okay, so uh, you and see on my screen see. here the, uh, the, the, the skip connection, which I think we already discussed uh, when we discussed uh, time series, uh, I think LSTNet had uh, skip connections. So it's the same idea. Basically, we want to uh, we want to uh, uh, avoid information being forgotten as we go through all those layers. You know, the the vanishing gradient problem, and uh, and so uh, you have those connections that skip layers and literally re-inject the input signal to uh, downstream layers, right? So that's that's a very elegant ID and it's extremely powerful. And here you can see a, a 34 layer ResNet, right? Which we'd call ResNet 34. And we can see all those skip connections that keep feeding um, the input to, uh, to uh, deeper layers. So that information gets propagated all the way down to the, to the output layer without uh, losing too much. So very very cool ID and um, and ResNet was uh, published in 2016, right? So that's five years ago, which which is both very long ago mm. <laughs> and not so long ago. And uh, ResNet is still uh, a favorite, right? It's still a mm -hmm. favorite. So mm -hmm. it's one of those reference models that um, machine learning teams uh, rely on for lots of things. And today we are going to train from scratch, okay? But a lot of teams also use pre-trained versions, right? And they fine-tune them. So can you tell us a little bit about that and, and you know, what's the point of, of doing that? Um, so yes, um, so the image classification uh, algorithm from SageMaker uh, can be run in two modes, uh, full training and transfer learning. Uh, in, full, in full training mode, uh, the network is initialized with random weights and train on user data from scratch. On the opposite, in transfer learning mode, um, the network is initialized with pre-trained weights and just the top three connected layer is initialized with random weights. Then mm -hmm. the whole network is fine-tuned with new data and uh, the ID underlying transfer learning is that you leverage with, sim with simple readjustment readjustment or fine tuning some already trained networks in order to generalize with other data sets yeah that's that's a really good technique and uh, mm -hmm. let's say if let's say you have you know a million images describing your own uh, you know your own objects and and for your own business case um, so you would probably train from scratch maybe once right get that uh, baseline model and then you could say okay now i want to specialize my model to detect maybe a subset of those uh, object classes so i would just fine tune on you know maybe a 100 classes instead of the thousand okay maybe we just want to figure out dogs so we just fine tune on dogs and increase accuracy right so train once uh, fine tune many times is mm -hmm. is what I see what I see customers doing, uh, but again today we're going to train from uh, from scratch because it's crazy and and we like <laughs> it crazy. 
Okay, so uh, we have a data set and a big one. We have a built-in algo, so let's put everything together uh, and, and start looking at code. So I, I think the first step would be to understand how do we get those one million images <laughs> ready, <laughs> right, on our own machine? So that is a problem in itself, okay? That is a problem in itself. So let me close this. And these are the steps, my friend. And uh, and I have to say they're not super well documented uh, <laughs> and I had to uh, do some exploration. So we're gonna go slowly here. So first, obviously you need to download the data set. So you register to the ImageNet website and uh, and then it's not just, hey, I'm going to download 150 gigs, okay? <laughs> um, because you, what you end up downloading is a bunch of huge uh, compressed tar files, and there's a little more to it. So actually, um, the TensorFlow repository has a, a really cool script called Download ImageNet that kind of takes uh, that heavy lifting away. Uh, and it just needs uh, your ImageNet username, your ImageNet access key, and uh, and that's about it, right? And you launch this, and it's going to go and fetch the data set. It's going to extract it and save you some uh, sleepless nights. Now, when I say sleepless nights, I really mean it because I downloaded this using a, a, a very nice EC2 instance. Uh, right, with and that's fast about networking. it, right? And you launch this, and it's going to go and... and and it took me it took me five days it took me five days to download this thing right so uh, you definitely want to make sure you launch it in a way that uh, using no hop or something else using in a way that's not going to be interrupted okay so five days later you have uh you have a a file hierarchy that's going to look uh something like this okay so you have the training data set. So here you have one folder for each one of the thousand classes. Okay. And you have all the validation images in one folder, right? Which is why I, uh, I used another magical script that will put the validation images in their own specific directory. Okay. So that we have neatly organized training images and validation images okay that's how that's how we want the things to be organized now we could say okay well we're just going to upload those neatly organized images to s3 and we can train like that and in fact we can it's called uh, it's called image mode but intuitively we can see you know loading and reading 1 million individual files for a large number of epochs even if S3 is fast, even if your instance is fast, there's going to be a lot of overhead, right? There's going to be a lot of overhead. So we're just managing those files. And of course, there's always the chance that one of them gets lost and, and you're in a, in a world of trouble figuring it, figuring out which one it is. So instead, we are going to use a file format called Record IO. And Record IO is actually part of Apache MXNet. And uh, there's a similar concept in TensorFlow called uh, TF record files. And the, the idea is the same. The, the idea is to basically pack all your images into a much lower number of files. And in fact, here, I'm going to pack my uh, validation images in six files, right, with a record structure. And I'm going to pack my you know, hundreds of thousands of training images into about 140 chunks. Okay, so now I only have to manage, a, you know, let's say 100 something files uh, instead of managing a million files. Okay, so you may wonder how I chose to pack into 140 is because the rule of thumb is you want those chunks to be, let's say, about 100 or 200 megabytes large, right? And we'll explain why later on. So that's how I came up with that number. Okay, so we're going to end up with those files and we're going to see why that's useful. Uh, and there's a, a nice tool in MXNet called im to rec so image to record IO, that just gets the job done. So you just point that script 
at the top of your uh, training uh, folder or, or validation folder, and it's going to build those chunks. And then it looks like this, right? So you can see I have those record IO files. Let's see how many I have. Yeah, I do have 140 files, so it worked. <laughs> and I guess I have six validation files, right? And you can see there are a couple of hundred megabytes each, which is what I was shooting for. Okay, and then I just sync all that stuff to S3, okay? Um, and now in S3, I have my record IO files for the training set and my record IO files for the validation set, okay? So it's very convenient because, you know, fewer files to move around uh, and it's going to be super important for performance, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, because we are going to use something called pipe mode, and Sego will explain that in a second. So let me open the notebook, and it always starts the same. Install the SageMaker SDK, grab a default bucket, and now we get to one of those really cool features in SageMaker for high-performance training called mm -hmm. pipe mode. So. And this is where all those files will come in handy. So Sego, tell us everything we need to know about pipe mode. Uh, so yes, with pipe, uh, pipe input, input mode, uh, your data set is streamed uh, directly to your training instance uh, instead of being downloaded first. Um, this means that your uh, training, training job starts sooner, finish quicker, and need less uh, disk space. Uh, pipe mode uh, enables the following. Um, the first one, uh, shorter startup times, uh, because the data is being streamed inst instead of being downloaded uh, to your training instance. Uh, secondly, an higher IO throughput, uh, throughput uh, due to your um, high performance uh, streaming agent. And after the third thing is uh, virtually uh, limitless uh, data processing cap capacity. So um, even though uh, pipe mode uh, is recommended for a large data set, uh, you've got the other, other option, file mode, uh, which is still useful for small files uh, that fit uh, in memory and where uh, the algorithm has a large number of uh, epochs. Uh, together, both input modes, uh, file and pipe, uh, cover uh, the spectrum of um, a good spectrum of uh, use case uh, from a small experimental training job to petabyte scale uh, distributed uh, training job. Yeah, that's exactly the point. So uh, mm. as you can see here, we are using that same training input object that we have used in all the previous episodes in order to define the properties for our training channel, a validation channel. So we say, hey, this is where the data in S3, uh, we want to fully replicate, meaning we want each instance to receive the full data set, but we are not going to copy, right? Because who wants to copy 150 gigabytes to each training instance? That's taking a long time, even with fast instances. And of course, you would need at least 150 gigs of storage on each training instance, which we need to pay for, right? So we're not going to do that because we're using pipe mode. So as Sego explained, we're streaming, you know, chunk yeah. by chunk. And uh, and we get all those cool benefits. And we use record IO data. So one extra thing here is that we actually shuffle the files. So uh, for each epoch, um, those record IO files that, that you saw here, uh, in fact, the, the training ones, yes, here, they're going to get sent in a different order so that we never train exactly in, in the same, those files in the same sequence, which, which could potentially introduce some, some bias. So mm -hmm. we shuffle paths, we pass a random seed, and, and we just shuffle those things. Right. Uh, we don't need to shuffle for the validation data set, obviously, because we're predicting and then the, the order has no, has no impact. OK, so that's why we want to use those record IO files. Simpler to move around. Um, we can shuffle them and we can stream them and get training to start immediately instead of copying those humongous 
uh, data sets. And believe me, for computer vision, 150 gigs is actually not that big. Mm -hmm. uh, not that we have many customers who train on much, much larger data sets, and they absolutely use Spike more for that. Okay, so we have our inputs uh, figured out. Uh, we see uh, the data uh, location in S3. You know, same old, same old. We grab the container name for the image classification algo in our region. Nothing new here. And we get to our friend, the estimator. So Sego, what do we have here? Looks familiar, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. So you've got, we've got the container, uh, of course, the role, the instance count. So you took three. Ooh, what have I done here? <laughs> <laughs> three p three uh, eight eight sorry eighty three uh, for this uh, training job, and after uh, we add another stuff uh, that you appreciate the use the potential the poten the capability of using um, a spot instance in this training, and that we are going to see that it can be uh, very interesting uh, when you scale uh, your training job to think about um, uh, spot instance, and after you've got. So yes, yeah, the um, output path and the very uh, common stuff um, uh, we, are we are now familiar with. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to be cute here because, of course, the estimator object is familiar, but this is brutal, <laughs> okay? Um, what I'm doing here is... With those two lines, I'm saying, hey, you're going to trade my ResNet on 8 P3DN24XL. And some of you will say, so what? You know, what is P3DN24XL? Well, it's just the largest and most powerful. Monster. <laughs> it's a monster. It's monster. the largest one you can you can use right now on SageMaker. So you We've used P3 2XL, I think, in previous examples, mm. which has one NVIDIA V100 GPU. And maybe you've used P3 16XL, which has eight GPUs, and that's already a very healthy baby, right? <laughs> P3DN is even bigger because it has uh, it has still has V100 GPUs, eight of them. Uh, but those uh, those GPUs have twice the amount of GPU memory compared to the the P3 uh, the vanilla P3 instances, so to speak. So we can train larger jobs with larger batch sizes, and they have 100 gigabit networking, so that distributed training and communication happens faster. And they really are monsters. So here I'm selecting eight for a, a nice total of 64 GPUs in that training job. Okay, so probably not something you can do in the office. Um, <laughs> probably not something you want to do in the office anyway, right? So this is what we're trying to do. And of course, we want to use Spot because those instances are a little bit on the expensive side, given how powerful they are. So you absolutely want to use Spot. And we'll see later on how much Spot saves us here, right? Um, and uh, it's going to be a nice number because I, I know it already, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> Try to guess, right? Okay. Um, by the way, um, we announced the P4 family uh, just last week, I think. Uh, uh, Jeff Barr uh, wrote a, 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 another great blog post on this, so you can find it on the AWS blog. Uh, so they're right now, as we speak, they are available on. Uh, on EC2, and they're going to be available on SageMaker very, very soon. Okay, so we can revisit the episode and go with the P4 instances. And these are even bigger. They have the latest A100 GPU, uh, which has almost 7,000 GPU cores. And on, on the top of my memory, I think they have 40 gigabytes of GPU RAM. So even crazier, even crazier, and lots, lots of uh, networking bandwidth. Okay, so even if you need something bigger, uh, you know, bigger is coming. Okay, um, what about hyperparameters? Sego, help us here. 
<laughs> so um, in the case of uh, computer vision model, you know, we've got like a, a huge a kind of huge number of uh, hyperparameters. Again, you can play with them in order to um, add fast uh, to, to faster uh, your uh, deep learning model. So here we've got uh, the number of layers. Here is like um, you choose uh, the number the number of layers you want. So there there are different flavors of ResNet. We've got ResNet 50, Res ResNet 150. 52, etc. So in our case, we are going to use a ResNet 50. So you just put uh, 50 as the number of layers. Um, for sm small image, um, try to choose a, a lower number like uh, 20 or 11 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, I think the other hyperparameter which is important here is the use pretrain model equal to zero or one. Um, if it's set to one, uh, it will enable uh, transfer learning. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so here in our case, as we want to, 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 to train from scratch, we put uh, zero, but otherwise if you want to, to, to leverage again the transfer le learning aspect of uh, computer version model, you put one. Uh, number and, of I think the, the, and then it gets initialized with uh, uh, a, a model train on ImageNet actually, right? I exactly. Think the, yeah, that's it what would you be, would get. Exactly, the, 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 the default weight uh, uh, obtained thanks to a, um, a training on ResNet image, yes. Uh, after the number of classes, so here it's uh, 1,000, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. That's an easy uh, one. That's an easy one, of course. Uh, the number of training sample uh, is... Um, so one million, okay. yeah, well, yeah one point so two million, yeah. yeah. Exactly. After we've got the batch, uh, mini batch size, uh, here it's so, so it is of course the number of image uh, each batch each batch uh, with content. As you took some monster for the training, <laughs> we can put uh, we can put um, we can put like a, a quite a big uh, number of mini batch size to uh, to two thousand eight hundred. Let me quickly explain how I figured it out because it sounds yes. like one of those magical values. And I, I don't want their, uh, our friends out there to 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 think we're <laughs> hiding something. So the big secret is, you start with, you know, ten twenty four. <laughs> if it's too high, your job is gonna fail. Saying, uh, you know, GPU runs out of memory and you go mm -hmm. low. If it if it works, then you can look at the at the GPU utilization in 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 CloudWatch, which we'll look at later on. And you can say, oh, I'm only using about, let's say, 50%. Okay, so I'm, I can double it. And then and then you play that game and trying to find, you know, how you get to 100% GPU memory usage. And you're going to fail a few times, but 2816, I, I don't quite remember why <laughs> I, I came up with this, but trust me, this is the actual value that maxes out <laughs> GPU memory. Okay, so here's here's what how I've done it. Okay, Sego, what about the rest? Um, so after we've got like the learning rate, of course, very well known. So I thought maybe the, the other one which is interesting is the learning rate uh, scheduler uh, factor. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's gonna, it's actually the ratio uh, to reduce uh, learning rate, um, learning rate used uh, in conjunction with the uh, learning rate scheduler step uh, parameter. And the idea is um, you're gonna, yes, uh, try to um, decrease uh, your uh, learning rates uh, with different uh, value. Mm -hmm. And after, I think that the um, KV star, uh, you're going to talk about it later. So I don't want to, uh, to, 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 to tell you that. Just the weight update synchronization mode uh, during uh, the distributed training. Mm -hmm. And after the early stopping, uh, if you want to early stop, and after the early stopping patients, uh, when you want to stop. Okay, of course, all of these are documented in the, uh, yeah. in the documentation and, and you can read about it. And again, if you're curious to you know about that, the big secret is try it out, experiment. <laughs> and I'm sure this is not the best combination, but you know, I love to play with those hyperparameters and, uh, and I figured out, okay, why not divide the, the learning rate by, by two every 30 epochs? And it, it works kind of okay. And I found that starting with a very high learning rate was actually a good way to speed up training. So 
you know, just me forcing the forcing Red Dead to learn quick uh, because I'm a very impatient person. <laughs> but feel free to experiment with this. Okay, uh, yeah, quick word about the distributed training here. So obviously we are training on eight different instances. All of them get a full data set, but um, uh, we want them to, we want to make sure that we have uh, the same model uh, on each of those instances, right? That they learn uh, in sync. Uh, there's another way to do this where uh, you can learn asynchronously and where you allow those uh, in-training models to be a little bit different, sometimes quite different on the instances. But I found in this particular case that uh, I got better results by syncing uh, the models. And the way it works is pretty much uh, all instances receive a training batch, they forward propagate it, back propagate it, compute gradients, apply their gradients, send them to everybody else. Everybody else receives everybody else's gradients, applies them, and then we move on to the next batch. Okay, so it's a, you know it's a stop and go kind of way, and that guarantees you have the same model all the time. There are other techniques techniques to do this, but I thought I felt and I found out this worked best here. Okay, um, all right, so I think we have everything we need, and then we call fit, and then the usual stuff happens, right? Uh, we've seen this at every single episode, fire up the instances, download the input data, uh, download the container, uh, and, uh, and we can see this fantastic thing here. You can see downloading input data takes zero seconds because Live mode. We are not downloading anything, right? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you're downloading the first record I.O. file. So we're kind of streaming it, which is not downloading it. So zero start of time when it comes to data download. Then we get into that crazy training log. And uh, we're not going to go through it because that training job actually ran for five hours. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Even with the monsters, it took five hours because it is a big training job. So let's start uh, see. Uh, and of course, then my Jupyter notebook timed out, and the only place I can find the log is in Cloudwatch. <laughs> but this is what Cloudwatch is for, right? And so we can see uh, if we look at one of the training logs that we actually hit early stopping at epoch 150, okay, meaning. Uh, Epoch 120 was probably the best. I think we did set patience to 30. Yes. Okay. And yeah. uh, so there we go. And so we trained for quite a while still. And we got a validation accuracy of about 65%, which, which is for a newbie like me is, uh, is pretty satisfying, I should say. Uh, it's not state of the art, but then again, I am not state of the art at all. <laughs> so just read the doc and tweaked uh, those things, probably messed around with those hyperparameters too much, but I still get something that's not too ridiculous, right? Would you say that, Sego? <laughs> no, you're not ridiculous. You're in state of the art. Yeah, yeah. All right. No, I'm not state of the art. Uh, anyway, so that's not too bad, okay? And now if we look at the training job itself, we can see, ah, that's my favorite part, right? Um, that's the part that I understand, right? 70%, <laughs> we saved 70% of that cost thanks to Spot, okay? And so we ran for five hours, as you can see, uh, and... Uh, and that's that's okay. I mean, um, a few years ago, a few years ago, uh, this doing this uh, took a full research lab, right? I mean, the image competition is not just for you know guys like me. It's for you know serious people with you know, large budgets, lots of resources, lots of super bright uh, PhD students, and so on. And and that's the only way you can get that done. Right. And here, you know, a few years down the line, using AWS and SageMaker, all it takes is actually this. And now that I think of it, it I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think this is actually the shortest 
notebook yeah. we've seen this season. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. In the shorter, but see, I think. Yeah. Um... yeah. See what we do here. Define inputs. Upload. Uh, yeah, it's it's in S3, so we upload it to S3. Define inputs. Grab a container. Set a few parameters. Okay. Set hyper parameters. Call fit. Right, so I would say that's one, two, three, four. All right, it, it is honestly 10 to 12 lines of code. Yeah, that's crazy, I know right? to exaggerate a lot, but it is really 10, 12 lines of code. And we train a state of the art model that was winning competition just a few years ago. Um, and uh, that's still used in production all over. So, not too bad. Okay, so. What else can we see here? Let's go down a little bit. Uh, we can see a link. Oh, we can see all of the hyperparameters, and we can get our graphs. OK, so we can see uh, infrastructure graphs. Mm -hmm. OK, so we see that the CPU utilization is, is nice, is high, and uh, pretty constant, meaning the instance is very busy. So that's good. So memory utilization is not so high because we're not uh, doing so much on the instance itself. And the really important thing is this uh, GPU utilization. Okay, so so what that six hundred means? Okay, remember we have eight on uh, we have eight GPUs, right? So max use would be eight hundred percent. And we, you know, we're consistently getting to uh, you know six yes yeah, six seven hundred percent and the average is probably you know just a tad before uh, below 600 so and we can see we keep those gpus busy right so those drops that you see here are usually caused by synchronization right it's the cost of synchronizing uh, but again it's it's a trade-off between usage or utilization i should say and model convergence. So feel free to try, you know, asynchronous distributed training. I mean, you, you'll see that you get slightly higher GPU utilization, but maybe your model uh, needs more epochs to converge. So, you know, and there's, there's no silver bullet. You have to try it out. But we see we are keeping those uh, GPUs busy. And we can see GPU memory utilization is crazy high. Again, 800% uh, would be completely full and we get to 754 so um, the geek in me thinks that we could actually try and increase that batch size just a little bit to get a little more gpu usage but that's that's already good right and then of course we see training accuracy and validation accuracy so we get to 90 almost 91 percent training accuracy before we get stopped uh, so certainly we could have trained a little, a little longer. Maybe we could, uh, maybe that patient setting is a little too low. Maybe we should give a little more time to, uh, uh, to uh, the optimizer uh, for, uh, for, for uh, you know, to explore. But it's already pretty good. And validation accuracy gets to, like we see, you know, 60, yeah, 65%, something like that, right? Uh, we probably see that value. Uh, somewhere else, okay? All right, uh, so we can see the same things in uh, in CloudWatch. Uh, yeah, we have a few more minutes, so let me show you CloudWatch really quickly. Uh, okay, view algometrics. And here they come. So let's take maybe this and this, right? Uh, let's go. Yeah, I trained this thing. Yeah, last night. Right. So need to go and grab that. Maybe we can look at one minute resolution. See how easy it is, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, like that. So here we go. Make this big. Okay, and we have our uh, validation. 